This is the third part of our analysis of the New Testament teachings about the time of the end. In our previous study, we dealt with the response of Jesus to his disciples regarding their question about the time of the end that is recorded in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 24. Just to remind you that the question that Jesus, that disciples ask Jesus concerned primarily the destruction of the temple and the city of Jerusalem, which the disciples obviously connected with the end of the world and the second coming of Christ. If you recall, the, 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 the key question that the disciples asked Jesus was, when? They were interested in the timing. When will the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem take place? And what is the sign of the second coming of Christ that would mark the end of the world. The disciples, as we could see, they tied together the destruction of the temple and the city of Jerusalem with the second coming of Christ and the end of the world. However, Jesus showed to them the destruction of the temple and city of Jerusalem and the end of the world and the second coming of Christ are two separate and different events. So the disciples ask Jesus when? And the next question they ask Jesus, so what is the sign? What is the sign when this will take place that we know that it is here? And as we saw that Jesus separated these two events. And in chapter 24, in verse 15, Jesus, showed, Jesus made very clear to the disciples that the sign on the basis of which they will know that the end of the temple, the city of Jerusalem was there when they see the Roman army. They would not know it before. And then the second event, Jesus told the disciples, you ask about the sign of my coming, that you know that I am coming. And Jesus says, when you see me coming, when you see me on the clouds of, of, of heaven, coming into the power of, of, uh, and glory, you will know the time here, not before. And then we saw that actually before Jesus answered the question of the disciples with regard to the question when and what is the sign, he wanted to give them the warning. And that warning is found in verses 4 to 14, where Jesus told them that as they were waiting for the end to come, there would be many different and difficult situations and events to take place in the world. We saw it. Jesus listed some of those events that would take place. 
But Jesus began that with one great warning to his disciples. Be careful. Watch that you don't be deceived. And Jesus told them there will be na- many who will claim to be called by Christ's name, and Christians, who will come in Jesus' name. And they will refer to those events with a purpose on the basis of those events to establish the date and an exact timing of the second coming of Christ. And Jesus also concludes at the end of this section, in verse 10, he says, sorry, it's actually verse 11, that many false prophets will prophesy, they will arise, they will use contemporary events to establish a different interpretation claiming that those events clearly pointed and marked the time of the end. And Jesus said, it will be actually misinterpretation and many people will be misled and they will be deceived. So Jesus' warning, as we saw last time, was don't be deceived. These events will take place throughout the history with every generation of Christians. They took place with the generation of the disciples. They took place with every generation Christians. And evidently they will escalate, they will intensify as the history of the planet Earth is approaching to its end. But Jesus says, don't use those events to be deceived that on base of them, you come with, in such a mood of sensationalism, with the alarm that causes a fear, because the end is not yet. So Jesus mentioned here the events that will take place, and there will be the signs of Jesus coming. But they are never intended by Jesus to be at the sign of the end. So keep in mind, The disciples never asked Jesus about the signs. And Jesus never spoke of signs. The disciples asked Jesus about the sign. Jesus provided them the sign and told them, you will know the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem is here. When you see the army, Roman army, standing on the holy place, And also you will know with those supernatural signs in heaven that will take place that the planet Earth has entered into the last period of its history. And then Jesus says, but you will not know when the end actually will take place. And then Jesus says, then the sign will appear. That's what the disciples asked Jesus about. And that sign that Jesus is coming, that the end is here, when we see Jesus actually coming on the clouds of heaven. So, this is about the response that Jesus gave to his students, uh, to his disciples, with regard to that question, when and what is the sign? Once Jesus explained to the disciples what they were asking about, now Jesus went one step further. And he wanted his disciples to give some special warning. And that warning of Jesus is actually described from verse 32 going all up to Matthew chapter 25. Actually, the main point that Jesus wanted his disciples to understand is found here in these verses. So please keep in mind, 
Jesus said to his disciples that there will be events in this world reminding them always of the reality of the second coming of Christ. And Jesus told in verse 32, Learn from the fig tree when after the long winter you see that its branches become tender and puts forth its leaves. You know that the summer is near. So also when you see all these events taking place, you know that the second coming of Christ is approaching. It's near. It's not here. But it's coming. And then Jesus said to the disciples, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Most likely that Jesus had in mind here the destruction of Jerusalem. And then in verse 36, Jesus here gives, gives another key warning to his disciples. The first one was, don't be deceived on the basis of the current events. Don't do it. But then Jesus said in verse 36, but of that day and hour, no one knows. You see in verse 34, Jesus told them very clear that the generation of the disciples will not pass until the destruction of Jerusalem take place. But then Jesus moves to his coming and he said, but of that day, and of that hour of his coming, nobody knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. One more time, Jesus uh, uh, reminds his disciples, don't be deceived. The events, regardless how terrible they are, you're not supposed on the base of them watching in those events that you be deceived by calculate the date of the end of the world and, and second coming of Christ. And now Jesus is here in different way. He repeats to his disciples about the day and hour of his coming actually Nobody knows, including the angels in heaven. And Jesus said, the date of the second coming of Christ, it's a mystery that God has reserved only for himself. And in order to illustrate it to his disciples, Jesus goes to the Old Testament and he takes one Old Testament event somehow to illustrate his disciples. Keep in mind this concept that of the day and hour of his coming and, and the end of the world, nobody knows. So we read in verse 37, Jesus says, for, the word for is telling us that Jesus is talking about the today and hour mentioned in the previous text. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So it will be the coming of the Son of Man. There will be two working in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Luke adds, few more comments in chapter 21 and he says two will be in the bed husband and wife one will be taken another one will be will be left that two people working one will be taken another one will be left 
And then Jesus concludes this Old Testament event that he's using as an illustration. And he said, therefore, what's the meaning of the word therefore? It points to the previous text. Therefore, in the light of what I just said, you be on the alert. For you do not know which day your Lord is coming. So in order to illustrate to his disciples that actually nobody knows the exact time of the end of this world and his coming, he's referring to the time of Noah and to the flood. Unfortunately, many preachers from the pulpit and many Christians are using this reference to the time of Noah and the flood for the purpose actually to show that all these details that Jesus mentioned here are actually another signs of the end. And what are those signs? It was popular preaching is that people will eat and drink. People will get married and divorce. People will be working together, being involved in many different activities. And this will be the sign of the end. Really? So it means never before in history, people are getting married and divorced. People are building houses and making better houses. People were working in the field or women grinding in the mill, etc. This can never happen before in history. It will strictly happen at the time of the end. Is that what Jesus tried to say? Brothers and sisters, you can see that how so many times people are making something or a biblical teaching and what actually Jesus said that does not make any sense. Why did Jesus refer to the time of Noah? What is the point that Jesus made? He made it in this concluding statement of verse 42. Therefore, you be on the alert, be on the watch, for you don't know which day your Lord is coming. People did not know at the time of the flood. They did not know the exact timing of the flood. So Jesus said the same will be happen, the same will happen at the time of the end. You remember the flood. Two by two those animals entered Noah's ark. At the end Noah and his family entered and the angel of the Lord shut the door. People were terrified as they were watching. The first day was over and nothing happened. But people were still afraid and watching what will happen. Was Noah correct? The second day, nothing happened. Everything was normal. The sunrise, the sunset, and finally, people went on their regular business. Getting married, eating, drinking, going to the place of work, doing ordinary uh, home businesses. Everything was normal. The third day, the same. And finally, people started mocking at Noah, ridiculing him, how he's there in, with, with the animals in the, in the ark. They went to sleep in the evening, nothing happened. The fourth day, the same. The fifth day, the same. The sixth day, the same. The seventh day, people woke up. They got up. It was a sunrise. People went to their regular work, to their regular business, doing well, already established activities. And then the Bible is telling us, and Jesus reminds us of this. And then the flood came suddenly when nobody expected. So Jesus said, 
Therefore, you be also on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. So you can see that with the arrest of this eschatological and apocalyptic discourse on the Mount of Olives, how much Jesus reminds his disciples. Not, some of, not only that nobody will be able on the base of the current events that taking place to actually establish the timing of the end of this world history as the time of the end and to establish the date for the second coming of Christ. Not only the Jesus, but Jesus wanted to tell them very clearly that the end will come suddenly, exactly as it happened at the time of Noah, at, at the time of the, of, the, of the flood. This is actually what Jesus wanted to tell his disciples, but only to his disciples, but also to the future generations of Christians, including us who believe that we live at the time of the end, before the second coming of Christ. And actually the rest of what Jesus tried to say to his disciples, build on this. So Jesus use other illustration in order to make point to the disciples. First, he used analogy of two stewards. The master went the business far away. And then Jesus says, therefore be on alert for you don't know which day your Lord is coming, but be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason you be ready too, for the Son of Man is coming at the hour when you do not think he will. And then Jesus talks about the foolish or the evil servant who did not take seriously the return of the master. And he says, who knows when he will come? And then Jesus said in verse 50, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him at the hour when he does not know. I hope that we can see at this point how over and over again Jesus repeats his disciples that his coming will be very sudden. Nobody will be able to predict the exact date or the time when it will happen. And you will notice that Jesus is using analogy of a thief who comes during the night unexpectedly, suddenly. Nobody counts on that, on that possibility. So Jesus says the same will be about the second coming of Christ. There will be nothing given to us in the Bible or in the events of this world that we will be able to use and to establish the exact date of the time of the end and the second coming of Christ. And now we are moving to chapter 25 and Jesus is using a parable of the ten virgins. And I know that so many times preachers are analyzing these parables to establish all kinds of different theological thoughts. But the main reason why Jesus used that parable was in verse, verse 13, where Jesus says, Be 
on the alert then, or therefore be on the alert, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Actually, I hope that we can see. The disciples ask Jesus, when? Jesus told them, there will be events in the world. Don't be deceived. Don't look and focus on those events, Jesus says, for the purpose of establishing the exact time, timing of the end or the second coming of Christ. Jesus told them, you ask about the signs, these are the signs. But then Jesus constantly is warning his disciples that nobody knows when actually the end will take place. Nobody will be able to establish the exact date of the time of the end and the second coming of Christ. But Jesus constantly is repeating, it will be suddenly. It will be a time where nobody ex ex uh, 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 expect that happened. Jesus says, be watchful, be alert. It will be sudden. In Luke chapter 12, verse 40, with reference to the time of the end and the second coming of Christ, Jesus says, you too be ready. For the Son of Man is coming then our that you do not accept, expect. We can see actually that disciples constantly, constantly we are reminded of Jesus that never, never use popular events for the purpose of establishing the timing of the second coming. The same line was Apostle Paul. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, Jesus told Christians in Thessalonica, so in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it's, uh, in verse 1, Jesus told disciples, Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourself know very well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like birth pangs upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. You can see that the all the language that Apostle Paul is using here is actually the language that Jesus used in teaching his disciples about the timing of the time of the end. And Apostle Paul is also using here the expression with the birth pangs. This is the only, all the indication of the time of the end. But we don't know. Apostle Paul makes very clear. We know that the day of the Lord will come like a thief at the night. It's, it's evident that Apostle Paul is using here the illustration of Jesus from Matthew 24. But not only Apostle Paul, Peter also. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 to 7, addressing different people that Peter actually calls mockers who will say that, that everything in the world is always the same from, as it was in the past and they will actually be laughing at the concept of the time of the end. Peter is telling them that the second coming of Christ will be suddenly we already dealt with this text. Peter says, God wants to come as soon as possible. For him, one day of waiting to come, it's like a thousand years. But Peter then adds, and he said, all those who do not believe in the second coming of Christ will have the same experience as the people before the flood. 
So he's using the same illustration from the time of Noah that actually the Jesus did in Matthew 24. But then Peter said, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief at night. So Peter also uses Jesus' illustration from Matthew 24 to show that even though people do not believe, but the second coming of Christ will certainly come and it will be suddenly. And finally, I have to mention also uh, the text from the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. In chapter 16, verse 15, John the Revelator actually quotes the statement of Jesus who said, Behold, I am coming like a thief. You can see that the most common illustration that the New Testament writers used with reference to the suddenness of the second coming of Christ was the analogy of a thief coming to rob a house during the night. At that event, actually would take place suddenly at the time when nobody accepts. Actually, we can see here very, very clearly that the clear New Testament teaching is that the second coming of Christ, it's a secret reserved only for God. We human beings are never, never given insight into the timing of the second coming of Christ and we are never given anything from the Bible on which base we would be able to establish the exact date of the second coming of Christ. But I have here to address uh, another notion and that's usually the argument that many people are using when we try to refer to Jesus' statement in Matthew 24, verse 36, but Jesus said, but of that day and hour, nobody knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. And they said, yeah, Jesus told us that uh, we are not able to know the day and hour when Jesus will come. But we are able to know the period of time when actually this will take place. Actually, Jesus very much dismissed a such understanding or such a notion. If we go to the book of Acts, chapter 1, we read in verse 6, that after Jesus' resurrection, as he spent with the disciples 40 days, at the end of those, those 40 days, that period, the disciples come to Jesus, asking him, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom of Israel? And then Jesus told them, it is not for you to know, please pay attention, times or epochs, which the Father has fixed by his own authority. The disciples asked Jesus, are you going now to establish? And Jesus told them, it is not given to you to know the times or epochs, how it's translated in my new American Standard Bible. These two expressions that are found in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 7, are found in also in another place in the New Testament, only two times. This is used in the whole New Testament. And it is the text that we already mentioned, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. Now as to the times and epochs, brethren, Paul said, you have no need of anything to be written to you. 
This text is very, very important. And what is translated in my New American Standard Bible, you can take some other Bible versions and you will see actually they translated it more correctly. These two expressions actually translate the two Greek words. It's the word chronos that is translated here as the word times. And word epochs is translation of the word kairos. The word uh, chronos with reference from which the word chronology comes, it refers to the period of time. But chronos is not a period of time. It's a particular point in time. You see, I came to a certain place at that time, that's Kronos, but I stayed there for a certain period of time. That's actually what Kronos is. So the point of time is Kairos. And now you have a period of time which is Kronos. And Jesus made very clear to his disciples, Apostle Paul repeated it, that neither Kronos, the period of time, no Kairos, a point in time, actually is revealed to us with reference to the time of the end and the second coming of Christ. So the people who believe that actually we cannot know the day and hour, but we can know the period of time when Jesus will come, actually it's clearly dismissed from the clear teaching of our Savior Jesus Christ and also what Paul stated and what Paul wrote in addressing particular situation of the Thessalonian in the church of Thessalonica in his first letter addressed to them. So, in the conclusion of this consideration of the New Testament teaching about the timing of the second coming of Christ, I want to really that we one more time go back to Matthew, Matthew 24, that we really see about the main point which Jesus wanted to make to his disciples. I notice that many preachers and many Christians, when they are talking about that signs of the end, speech that Jesus made to his disciples in answering their questions when, people just stayed, stayed with Matthew 24, but we are forgetting that Jesus' response is actually given in Matthew 24 and 25. And it appears that the main point Jesus wanted to make to his disciples in answering their question is actually found in Matthew 25. In Matthew 24, the disciples asked Jesus, when? And what was the response of Jesus? Nobody knows. It is not given to human beings to know the exact time. Human beings are not able to date day and hour or time or the point of time, period of time, when actually the end will come and the second coming of Christ will occur. Jesus made them very clear. But then Jesus concludes his discourse by pointing to disciples to something that is very important. Actually, what Jesus wanted to tell them, don't be bothered with those questions when. As you are waiting for me to come, you have to know that you have to focus not on the events in the world, but you have to focus on the task that you are commissioned to fulfill 
as you are waiting for the end to come. So Jesus used the parable of the ten virgins telling them that what we need is the Holy Spirit that Jesus presented with the symbol of the oil that those wise virgins they had for themselves and help them to go and to move through the time of crisis. Then Jesus used another parable. It was about the talents. He wanted to tell his disciples as they are waiting for the time of the end to come. The master went to the faraway country. They are waiting for his coming. But their commission, a special task and work and duties which they have to perform. So their waiting is not a passive waiting, but active waiting for Christ's return. So what kind of active waiting Jesus actually described in the last parable of the sheep and goat. And all that task is actually summarized in that statement, whatever you have done to one of the least of my brethren, this is what you have done to me. So Jesus wanted, wanted to encourage his disciples not to look into the events of this world, but to focus on the task that they were commissioned by Jesus Christ to fulfill in this world as they're waiting for the end to come. Actually, Jesus repeated this to his disciples in the book of Acts chapter 1 that we have just considered. Actually, as you know, that the disciples joined Jesus for a wrong reason. They hoped that Jesus, as the Messiah, would establish his messianic kingdom. That messianic kingdom would be the earthly kingdom. The Messiah, Jesus, will sit, as we saw it, in the temple on David's throne, begin to rule. But his disciples will be his prime ministers in his kingdom. Three and a half years, Jesus tried to help his disciples somehow to unlearn that idea. But nothing helped. And you remember that when Jesus, after he died on the cross, when Jesus met those two Disciples going to emails. You remember that disappointment. But we thought that he would be the one who would pro provide salvation to Israel. That expectation of the earthly kingdom could not get out of their minds. And the disciples could not read off that idea. Now we read in the book of Acts chapter 1. That after his resurrection, Jesus was associated and present among his disciples for the next 40 days. And we read in verse 3 that during those all those 40 days, one more time, Jesus tried to help his disciples to read off that idea of the earthly kingdom which the disciples ex accepted, expected that Jesus would actually establish. Forty days, Jesus made an additional, additional attempt to help the disciples to read off those ideas. And in that context, as we saw a few moments earlier, when Jesus thought that finally they were able to get it, they come to Jesus and asking him, Lord, are you going now to establish your earthly kingdom? And then Jesus told them, it is not given to you to know the period of time or a point in time which the Father has fixed by his own authority. Jesus said, it is not given to us. You remember what he told them previously about the day and hour. Nobody knows. Nobody knows about the timing of the second coming of Christ. 
it will be suddenly like a thief at the night, like what happened at the time of Noah. But then Jesus said to his disciples in verse 8, you don't know the time, but you are supposed to know that you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. What Jesus tried to tell his disciples, you don't know about the time. Jesus said to his disciples, don't occupy your time with the question when. You will never know it. It's never revealed to you. This is a mystery that God has kept for himself. Don't, don't spend time on that. It's not given to you. What is given to you, Jesus says, is that you understand about the task that you have to perform in this world. And that's the task of the preaching of the gospel. And Jesus said to his, to his disciples, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the world. This is what is given to us. But to set the dates and to establish different timing or period of time for second coming, it, it has not been given to us. My brothers and sisters, during my academic career, I have received numerous prophetic charts that were sent to me by different Christians, including many Seventh-day Adventists. There is one thing, actually, uh, when I'm talking about prophetic charts, I mean the charts that specified all details about different events to take place in the world until the second coming of Christ. Many people spend a great amount of time trying to make those prophetic charts and they sent to me and I couldn't see that two people were made able to make the same prophetic charts because they're not based on the careful analysis of the biblical text. It's about taking current events and reading them into the biblical text. In the last several years, whenever people send to me the idea or their prophetic charts, I would respond to them that the time they are investing in making those prophetic charts in the teaching of Jesus would be more profitable and more useful if they make the maps of the world, of the city or the town where they live, or the street where they are and to go to preach the gospel and reach those who are unreached for Christ instead of making those prophetic charts and going among the believers, their brothers and sisters and trying to persuade them for the ideas that they are going around and promoting. That's actually what Jesus tried to say to his disciples. He wanted actually to tell them not to spend their time on something that God clearly told us it is not revealed to us, that we have to focus on that great task that we are entrusted with. I just want to take a few last minutes and to show to you actually how Ellen White herself was very much in the line of teaching of Jesus 
with reference to the different date setting and calculating and establishing the timing of the end of this world history and the second coming of Christ. I just want to take a few minutes, I don't have a time, but just I want to show to you about four full pages, as you can see, of her statements about setting the dates of the second coming of Christ. I will try all these quotations to put on Facebook beneath the video on my Facebook that is named uh, uh, the cistern that holds the water or on my personal Facebook page and you can have the insight into all these statements of Ellen, Ellen White. I just want to read several of these statements. You can see I would need more than half hour actually to read what I have here in front of me. And Ellen White said, we are not to know the definite time either for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or for the coming of Christ. She said, why has not God given us this knowledge? Because we would not make a right use of it as if he did. And then she said, we are not to live about the time of excitement. She said, you will not be able to say that he will come in one, two or five years. Neither are you to put off his coming by stating that it may not be for 10 or 20 years. This is from Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 189. In the same volume, on page 191, she said, God has not revealed to us the time when this message will close or when probation will have an end. Those things that are revealed we shall accept for ourselves and for our children, but let us not seek to know that which has been kept secret in the councils of the Almighty. It is our duty to watch and to work and wait, to labor every moment for the souls of men that are already to perish. We are to keep walking continually the steps of Jesus. And then he said, Satan will be ready to give to anyone who is not learning every day of Jesus a special message of his own creating in order to make of no effect the wonderful truth for this time. Then in Review and Herald, November 27, 1900, she says, God gives no man a message. That will be five years or 10 years or 20 years before this earth history shall close. He will not give any living being an excuse for delaying preparation for his coming. Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 118, she said, Again and again have I been warned in regard to time setting. There will never again be a message for the people of God that will be based on time. We are not to know the definite time either for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or for the coming of Christ. She said we are uh, in Fundamentals of Christian Education 336. She said we are not of that class who define the exact period of time that shall elapse before the coming of Jesus the second time with power and, and, and glory. Selected Messages, Volume 2, she said, No one has a true message fixing the time when Christ is to come or not to come. Then in letter 28, 1897, she said, We are nearing the great day of God. The signs are fulfilling, yet we have no message to tell us of the day and hour of Christ appearing. The Lord has wisely concealed this from us that we may always be, be in the state of expectancy and preparation for the second appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ is in the cloud of heaven. Then she says, 
we are not of that class who define the exact period of time that shall elapse before the coming of Jesus the second time with power and great glory. Then the desire of ages, page 633, she said, the exact time of the second coming of the Son of Man, it's a God's a mystery. There is so much, please just allow me to conclude with something that really makes me a lot to think, and I believe it will make also you to take seriously this subject that we are talking about. She said, many who have called themselves Adventists have been time setters. Time after time has been set for Christ to come, but repeated failures have been the result. The definite time of our Lord's coming is declared to be beyond the can of mortals. Mortals. Before the times repeatedly set have passed, the world is more decided state of belief than before in regard to the near advent of Christ. They look upon the failures of the time setters with disgust. And because men have been so deceived, they turn from the truth substantiated by the word of God that the end of the things is at hand. Those who so presumptuously preach a definite time, in so doing, gratify the adversary of souls, for they are advancing in fidelity rather than Christianity. These are very serious warnings. Ellen White said that many Seventh-day Adventists, who is preaching about the definite time based on the current events, what are they doing? They are actually pleasing Satan himself. They are not preaching the gospel. They are actually advancing infidelity, unbelief, rather than Christianity. And then great controversy. Page 451, she said, the more frequent a definite time is set for the second advent and the more widely it is thought, the better is thought the purpose of Satan. Brothers and sisters, this is very serious matter. She said in Selected Messages 2.84, There will always be false and fanatical movements made by persons in the church who claim to be led of God. Those who will run before the ascent and will give day, day and date for the occurrence of unfulfilled prophecy. The enemy is pleased to have them to do this for the sexy failures and leading into false lines cause confusion and unbelief. My brothers and sisters, in concluding this three-part series, we can see that the clear New Testament teaching is that God has never promised to his people that he will send to them any individual, that God never promised that he will reveal to any group the exact date of the second coming of Christ, neither the period of time so that we would be established really that the end is here. And this is the sign of the second coming of Christ. And I wonder so many times when certain individuals come to us and telling us, I know at the date. But God said, Jesus said, the Apostle Paul said, Peter said, the book of Revelation telling us, and the prophet of our church is telling us that we will never know the exact date of the second coming of Christ. And certain individuals, they come and say, I know. I hope that you can see the problem. No wonder that those individuals, they cannot go to the Bible. But the main argument that they are using is God 
show of it to me. Yes, brothers and sisters, the New Testament teaching is clearly it is not given to us to know the timing of the second coming of Christ. God has never revealed to us the date of the time of the end. But the Jesus told us very clearly that what is given to us, uh, that is given to us, it's the task of the preaching of the gospel message. Jesus made very clear in Matthew 24, in verse 14, that before the end comes, the gospel will be preached throughout the world. The book of Revelation is very much in line with what Jesus actually pointed to, telling us in chapter 14 that before the second coming of Christ, God will send to the inhabitants of this world his end time gospel. Jesus made very clear that this message of the gospel will be proclaimed. What is the content of that message? Is the gospel, what kind of gospel? The gospel of the kingdom. God has his people and through them God wants to send the message to the people in this world telling them that these events in this world is not the reality that God intended for human beings. God wants to tell the people in this world through his followers, through his believers, that the good news that they is offered to them, that's the good news of God's kingdom. That's the final word for all human problems, for all hardships of the people in this world. That's the gospel, the good news of the kingdom. When there will not be any more earthquakes, there will not be any more coronavirus, there will not be famine, there will not be hatred among the people. There will not be the tears, death, and everything that makes our existence on this earth miserable. That's the message that God wants his people to occupy themselves with. That's the task that God has put between them. Not that they occupy themselves with the different calculations trying to set the date of the time of the end of the second coming of Christ and try to go among their fellow believers and try to recruit them for their ideas which are not really founded and established in the Bible. Oh, may God help us that we can take seriously the task of the preaching of the gospel that Jesus Christ has set before us. That's why Jesus said, don't be deceived. Many people will be deceived, as Jesus says, but my followers will not focus on the events. They will not focus on the dates. They will focus on that task, task of the preaching of the gospel, trying to reach those who are unreached in the world with the gospel message, message of the kingdom, that Jesus is coming soon. And those events in the world, they are reminding us of the reality of the second coming of Christ.